This morning's reading comes from Matthew chapter 10. Jesus called out his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Jesus sent them out with the following instructions. Do not go amongst the Gentiles or any other town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not let any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I'm sending you out like sheep amongst the wolves. Therefore, be as wise as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will be not you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, pro proclaim it from the rooftops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Claire, for that reading. And what a great time of worship we've already had. And so good to celebrate the baptisms and Alpha, all that God is doing around our church. Um, just before we jump into the message this morning, I do have a quick announcement I'd like to make, very exciting announcement, uh, which is that Darren Rouse has joined our staff team for a couple of days a week. Welcome, Darren. And Darren will be helping us in three main areas. The first one is to help us with communications, especially with the gathering of stories and testimonies that we can share across our church in a variety of different formats. So that'll be via video, text, social media, etc. cetera. Um, and he wants also to build a team of volunteers to help with that. So if you've got an interest in photography or video, or you're a writer, or good at interviewing people, uh, or podcasting, whatever it might be, please let Darren know, he'd love to talk to you. Um, he's also going to be assisting us with the leadership of our 5.30 service while we're in an interim period waiting. Uh, we're still searching, as you would probably know, for a, a full-time associate minister. So Darren's going to be helping us with that in the meantime and with some occasional preaching. And we all know Darren's a fantastic preacher, so that's going to be wonderful. So thank you, Darren, for joining us. Um, we pray your blood. Where are you, by the way? Where, where is Darren? Is he hiding? He's hiding. Oh, there he is down the back. Oh, he's got his camera in hand. So. Uh, Darren would love to meet you after the service if you do have an interest in any of those things we've mentioned. You can go out into the area just by the lounge, straight through these doors. Darren will be there and he would love to chat with you if you'd be interested in being part of a team to help with uh, that creative work. Um, also, you can reach out to him at darren at one.org.au uh, if you'd prefer to email. So that's wonderful news. Bless you, Darren. Let's pray for him, and uh, then we're going to jump into the message. Lord, we thank you so much for Darren, for his gifts and his uh, calling. We thank you that he uh, is able to help us in this way. We pray your blessing upon him during this season. And we ask, Lord, that um, 
you would enable him to flourish and to do all that you desire through him in this, uh, in this, in this role that he is taking on uh, in our community. So we bless him, we pray you fill him with your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, as we look at this passage this morning, I pray your blessing on us, give us ears to hear what it is that you want to say to us this morning. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn to the person next to you just for a moment and say, good morning, it's wonderful to see you. Give them a high five. Say hello. All right. All right. So we do have the kids in with us this morning. So I'm basically going to preach until they take over, and then I'll stop. We'll see how long we last. Kids Church will be beginning again next week once term starts, but they're in with us today, um, and I believe a lot of our young leaders are doing some training today, so that's wonderful. Um, so let's jump in. We're talking about making disciples. This is the second week in a short series we're doing just to prepare the way for our Alpha course, really. We want to just talk a bit about why making disciples is such an important thing. And today I want to focus on this passage, which is so crucial to our understanding of what our calling is as followers of Jesus. Now, one of my earliest memories, um, I was very, very little. I'm, I'm not quite sure how little, but very little. And I crawled into my parents' room. Um, and what's remained in my mind from that experience was just how in the, the half light of the early morning, and I'm sure my parents were just thrilled that I was in there with them, um, but from my very small vantage point, everything looked so enormous. This is what I have in my, in my mind's eye. You know, the bed, the side table, the ceiling just seemed so high. I can see my dad's hand kind of poking out uh, beside the mattress. It's a very vivid memory, but what I, what I can recall from that moment is just how large everything seemed to my very small relative size. Now, of course, we don't stay small for very long. We grow up, we change, we learn, uh, we eventually prepare for life outside the family home. You know, slowly but surely, the surroundings that seem so gigantic and enormous to us when we're very small children will become smaller and eventually restrictive and perhaps even suffocating to our souls if we don't enlarge our point of view, our perspective, our field of view, if we don't take on new challenges and pursue new opportunities. And surely that's one of the purposes of childhood and adolescence, if we're growing up in a functional home, is to prepare us with the skills and the knowledge and the character that we're going to need as we head out into the world and make our own way to build our own lives, to prepare to do something meaningful and potentially even to start our own families. In fact, when this doesn't happen, as hard as it can be for parents to send their children out into the world, we know it must be done, or we risk restricting our children, coddling our children, and severely inhibiting their growth into mature and, we hope, emotionally healthy adults. What do we call this when it fails, when our kids don't manage that transition? They get stuck in a kind of weird, ongoing adolescence. Uh, in Canada, we used to call this the Peter Pan syndrome. You know, I'd be working with guys in their late 20s, early 30s who just really hadn't moved on from about 18 years old, were still stuck at home playing video games, not really pursuing the life that God had called them. So I used to call them Peter Pans. That was maybe unfair. But anyway, what do we call it? Generally, we call it a failure to launch. It's a failure to launch. And the thing is, parents, we know that the process of sending our children out into the world is going to be, or was, for those of you who have already done this, a hard mix of both wonderful triumphs and extremely painful setbacks. So once they leave home, we won't be there anymore to protect them. And it's going to be painful at times for them, and sometimes perhaps even tragic. So one side of us says, I don't want to let that happen. Now, they'll suffer in the world out there. But the other side of us knows that unless we uh, help them with this, unless that happens, they won't truly become themselves. They won't discover what they're capable of. Uh, they won't really get to discover their gifts. They won't learn resilience or grit. They won't develop the strength that's going to enable them to keep going when life is hard and find the power to overcome. And no matter how much we might try to avoid it, as we all know, the hard stuff 
comes for us all eventually. Now, ultimately, if what you value in life is safety and security and ease, then these moments of difficulty will be seen as a disaster. But if your value is in Christ and in the kingdom of God, then you'll see these setbacks, you'll see these, uh, these tragedies, these moments of suffering in a very different light. So you'll ultimately have a different perspective on trials. Perhaps, you know, you might not be able to say with First Peter, count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds but at least you will understand their value. So here's what the psychologist and professor at New York University, Jonathan Haidt, says in his book, next slide, The Coddling of the American Mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting, up a generation, setting a generation up for failure. This is what he writes, next slide, from time to time in the years to come, I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you will be lonely from time to time so that you don't take your friends for granted. I wish you bad luck again from time to time so that you will understand that your success is not completely deserved and that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. And when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat over your failure. It is a way for you to understand the importance of humility. I hope you'll be ignored so that you'll know the importance of listening to others. And I hope you'll have just enough pain to learn compassion. Whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen. And whether you benefit from them or not will depend upon your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. That's a challenging word. It's a difficult word. What is the message in your misfortunes? And if we have the right perspective, I think we'll be able to understand that they're not only misfortunes, they're not only setbacks, they're not only trials. So in a similar way, our reading this morning is full of both incredible triumphs and some warnings about very difficult trials. Incredible triumphs and warnings about difficult trials. So the core message of Matthew 10 is actually pretty straightforward. Jesus is sending his disciples, his 12 disciples at this point, out into the rest of Israel to carry on his mission in the world. So he's sending them on to continue on his mission that he has already started. So they've been given authority and power to do what Jesus does all over the towns of, and villages of Israel. They're going to heal the sick. They're going to drive out demons. They're going to raise the dead. They're going to preach the gospel, and some people will respond with faith. Lives will be changed. It's amazing. It's incredible. Praise God. But they're also going to be rejected and arrested and questioned by governors and kings and flogged and beaten and thrown into prison and possibly even killed. And in one section that we've left out this morning uh, from the reading today, the gospel message, Jesus says, may even cause families to turn on one another, sometimes even violently. But Jesus reminds them at the end of the reading, and in fact in a couple of other places through the text, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not give in to fear despite the challenges that you're going to face. Do not give in to fear. And trust in those moments when you're challenged and questioned that the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to overcome and to answer those who are accusing you and to face your trials with courage. For there's something, friends, much larger going on than just misfortune. Even in those moments when we are facing trials, Jesus is telling his disciples that through them the gospel is being proclaimed and despite the setbacks, the kingdom of God is advancing. So if you have the right perspective on suffering, then you can know that it's not only suffering, it's still hard, but it's something that God will use to create new possibilities for you, to create new opportunities for you. Now, we just celebrated Easter, didn't we? Gosh, that seems like a million miles ago, a million years ago, it's only two weeks ago. The Easter story reminds us at the heart of our faith is that even in the midst of death, God will make a way. That death is not the final word. Death does not have the victory, but we have a promise 
through Jesus' death and resurrection that life will always overcome, that Jesus will always make a way, even through death. And that's what we enact in baptism, isn't it? We just got to see some of the baptisms from last Sunday night. What are we doing when we baptize? We are rehearsing our death and resurrection. We are going down into death and coming up out of the waters into new life. It's a rehearsal of what is going to happen to all of us, but which we believe has already in some way by the power of the Holy Spirit happened inside us through faith in Christ Jesus, that we have faced death and we have experienced new life. And that means that even when our bodies do die, there will be resurrection life on the other side of that, which is already at work in us now. And that tells us that even in the midst of our trials and sufferings and temptations and challenges in this world, as we walk with Jesus in faithfulness, there will always be the promise that God can do something new and something powerful and something that will break through even the most difficult of challenges. Praise God. And we believe this because Christ has overcome the world. And he tells his disciples, therefore, because I've overcome the world, do not be afraid and don't get distracted by your opponents and accusers. And don't take too much money with you. Don't hoard wealth. Don't take all these extra shirts and sandals. You don't need them. I will be with you and I'll provide for you every step of the way. You do not need to provide for yourself. I am your Lord. Do not get distracted and don't take too much. Don't be weighed down by the cares and the worries of this world. So this chapter is a call to live a kind of radical obedience and faith. One that is deeply challenging to the materialist narrative that most of us have grown up in from the moment that we were born. That's been the air we've breathed from the day we took our first breath, that you need to acquire as much as you possibly can because that's the meaning of life. Well, we reject that narrative. We don't believe that that is salvation. We believe that Christ is the only way and that he'll provide for us and we do not need to live in this life weighed down by fear. Are you with me? We do not need to live in this life weighed down by fear. And one of the ways that fear manifests itself is this need to try to hold on to as much as we can because we're afraid to lose it. But in Christ, it doesn't matter what we might lose in this life, but we have all things in Christ Jesus and there is a promise for us, a kingdom for us, uh, uh, an inheritance for us that will be so much greater than whatever we might have been able to acquire in this life. So I couldn't help think, but think as I read this, and you may have thought this as well, that for the f- disciples' first foray into ministry, you know, certainly ministry without Jesus being physically present with them as he sends them out into all these different towns and villages, this seems like a really tough assignment. Did that occur to you? It's like, Jesus, this is their first go, and you're telling them that they're going to face all kinds of very difficult challenges, and you're not even going to be there with them, at least not physically. That seems tough, right? That seems kind of unfair. He's expecting a lot of them as their first launch into adulthood, as it were. And he's not kidding. You know, he's telling them that this is going to test them in just about every way that a person can be tested. And reading through this, you might immediately get the feeling that Jesus might not just be talking about his 12 disciples in first century Israel here, but he might be looking down through history and speaking to all of those who will follow him throughout the ages, including you and I, including you and I this morning. The first hint that we have of this is that Jesus strictly forbids his disciples to go into Gentile or Samaritan territory, but tells them, just go to the lost sheep of Israel. But then he says, nevertheless, you're going to be dragged before Gentile authorities to testify. And that's something that we know doesn't happen for many years after Jesus' death and resurrection. You know, when the disciples go out in the power of the Holy Spirit and begin to proclaim the good news into the rest of the Roman world. And so what Jesus is talking about here clearly goes beyond just the 12 disciples and includes us as well. There's something much more expansive happening in this teaching, friends. So Jesus knows that there are going to be men and women, even in Blackburn, in Melbourne, in Australia, 2,000 odd years after these words are spoken, who will be listening to these words and will be wrestling with the implications of what Jesus might be saying to them. 
So what is Jesus saying this morning? What is Jesus saying to you this morning? In 2024, what's the date today? The 16th, is it the 16th? Sorry? 14th, well I'm ahead of myself, pardon me. The 14th of April, 2024, mark it in your Bibles. Because today, you're hearing from Jesus that he is calling you into ministry. Last week, Linda spoke about the call of the disciples, and that is something we've all, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have heard his call. But now he's commissioning you into something new, a different kind of call, something that is going to challenge everything that you hold on to. The context here really helps us. See, at the end of Matthew chapter 9, Jesus has gone into the villages, he has begun his ministry. We're told that everywhere he went, preaching the gospel, and uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he was healing diseases and sickness and driving out demons, the same things that the disciples are then sent to do. Preach, speak to people about the kingdom, tell people the good news, and then touch their bodies, touch their broken hearts, heal their bodies, heal their hearts, meet their needs, and give them hope. In verse 36 of chapter 9, we're told that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So when Jesus looks out over this world, when Jesus looks at you, when Jesus looks at your friends, when Jesus looks at your family, he looks at us with eyes of compassion. He sees us as people who are often harassed and helpless, who feel stretched and broken and unable to hold it all together, like sheep without a shepherd. So the first thing I want to say here, because this is a challenging word, and I'm sorry if you're a visitor and you're like, hey, just checking out this church, this is a challenging word today. It's not always like this, I promise, sort of. The first thing I want to say, though, is that no matter how terrible we humans can be or how broken we can be, the way the Gospels reveal Jesus to us, the Son of God, is very, very clear. Next slide. Jesus doesn't hate people. Jesus doesn't hate people. He doesn't come in condemnation. He didn't come in judgment. We're told that in many places in the New Testament. So right here, I mean, I think you see the, the fundamental stance of Jesus toward the needs of the human race is one of compassion and kindness and mercy. He sees us as sheep who have ended up lost and helpless, harassed by fears and burdens and pains by our own sins and by the sins of others. It's essential to keep that in mind as we go along here this morning because even though, even though Jesus loves us and even though he has compassion upon us and does not hate us, and he loves us, friends, in a way that we could not even possibly even begin to comprehend, it doesn't mean that Jesus is always nice to us. Right? He turned the tables of the money changers over in the temple. He called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs, full of dead men's bones, whose disciples are sons of hell. That's not very nice, is it? It's not very nice. But he is speaking the truth. Now, if we, if, if we define nice here as, you know, never making anyone feel uncomfortable, well, Jesus was prepared to make people feel uncomfortable. And he did that because he loved them. Just like parents, if we don't push our children into places that will make them feel uncomfortable, they will never grow. They will never change. Just in our own lives, we know, unless you're challenged, unless you face the things that are perceived to be oppositions, so you face those things, you will not overcome them. You will not grow, you will not move forward. So, because Jesus loves us, 
He therefore will push us to places that feel at times like they are too much or too hard or beyond our capacity because he loves us. It would actually be an act of incredible hatred if he never challenged us to change because we'd be trapped in immaturity and we would never grow up and we would never reach our potential. But because Jesus wants us to reach after, to grow into, to become all that God has created us to be, he will challenge us and he will push us because he loves us. Jesus loves us so he doesn't coddle us. He's prepared to push us out of the nest of comfort he wants us to launch into our calling. So here Jesus preaches and he heals and gets involved in difficult situations and he meets practical needs. And then in chapter 10, he turns to his disciples, his students, and he says, now you guys go and do it. You go and do what I've been doing. He gives them the same ministry that he has. In fact, Jesus said at one time that we would do even greater things than these, something that I still haven't managed to really get my mind around. So even though in Matthew 10, it's only the 12 disciples, you know, later on we see in other parts of the Gospels, Jesus enlarges that group, it becomes the 72, and eventually on the day of Pentecost, it is all believers. Anyone who is filled with the Holy Spirit is sent and commissioned in the power of the Holy Spirit to do the ministry of Jesus. It's Jesus saying, all of my followers, all of my disciples are to share in my mission, and this is your mission, this is your calling in life. What do we learn from this? So first of all, let's look at what the disciples are told to do. And this shows us what the ministry of Jesus is meant to look like in our own lives. So they don't just go and tell people the truth, do they? They don't just go and preach at people. It's not just about speaking the truth. It's not just moralistic, right? They also go with healing and compassion and kindness and practical acts of service and love. So Jesus fed the hungry and raised the dead and touched the lepers. And the lepers are not just people with skin diseases, but it's a, it's a catch-all term to speak about those who were ostracized, those who were rejected, those who were on the outside, washed up. He touches them and brings them back into community, brings them back into love. And he wants us as his disciples to go and do the same thing. Again, why? Because Jesus doesn't hate people. He has compassion on us. And so we are called as his followers to extend that same compassion to others. On the other hand, and there's a balance to this, at the same time you have in verse 14, where Jesus says, if they don't listen to you, then shake the dust off your feet when you leave the town. Shake the dust off your feet. And this is a really strong statement. Uh, it's actually a kind of judgment, a warning at least. So it's actually a reference to what the Pharisees did when they were observing Jewish ceremonial and purity laws, that if they went to a Gentile town, if they had to, for whatever reason, go to a Gentile town or mingle amongst Gentile people, before they entered Jerusalem, before they crossed over the borders back into Israel, they would literally shake the dust off their feet to ensure that they didn't bring any unclean dirt back with them into God's holy land. It was a way of saying to the Gentiles, you're unclean. Even your dirt is unclean, right? It was a rebuke. And so for Jewish preachers, and that's what these disciples are doing, right? They're not going to Gentiles, they're going to Israel. So when they enter a Jewish town, if that town doesn't accept the message of the kingdom, they were to do what the Pharisees did when they left Gentile territory. It's a way of saying, this is a warning to you. If you don't accept what Christ has come to do for the lost sheep of Israel, it's going to end badly. It was an offensive act. So yes, we're supposed to come to others with compassion, as servants, with kindness and grace. We're, we're to come without condemnation to point people to Jesus. After all, as Jesus looks at us, he sees us as sheep who are harassed and helpless, and we believe that he is the only shepherd that can help them. And yet we're unapologetic about this, right? This is the truth that we believe. Or to put it differently, friends, we are called to not be ashamed of the gospel. We are called to not be ashamed of the gospel that we believe. So we're unapologetic. Not, we don't come to people like jerks. We come with compassion and grace. But at the same time, we're not going to be milquetoast doormats who give up and compromise at the slightest hint of opposition or ridicule. 
And this is something we all have to settle in our own hearts, because you will not be an effective disciple, or you, at least you won't be effective at making disciples, which in the end amounts to much the same thing, if you haven't settled in your heart that you are unashamed of the good news, that you truly do believe that Jesus is the only way. So Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, so be as wise as serpents, as innocent as doves. Be careful, be thoughtful, be strategic. All of that is important, but do not lose your innocence. Do not compromise the gospel. So there's a balance here, I think, between truth and grace. Um, okay, there's so much more that we need to say about this passage, but we have the kids in with us, so I'm going to wrap this up. I'm convinced, friends, that the whole passage uh, is captured, the heart of it, is from verse 8, where Jesus says, in the midst of his commission to his disciples, these words, next slide, freely you have received, freely give. Can we all say that together? Freely you have received, freely give. In that one statement, Jesus has captured the entirety, friends, of how the kingdom of God works. It is not earned, it is a gift. The kingdom of God is a gift, it is not earned. You don't deserve it, you receive it. It is a gift that is freely given to you, a costly gift that meant Jesus had to lay down his life to secure this for you, but then he gives it to you freely as a gift. And that's, a, that's at the heart of everything we believe as a church. We're not here to run a business, we're not here to try to turn people into just better versions of themselves. We're not here to just address moral issues. We are here to live into the gift of the kingdom of God, which changes everything. Everything about this is a free gift that you receive by faith. And if you can understand that, then you know there is nothing you can do to make yourself better, but you have to trust that the power of Christ in you, which you receive freely, will enable you to become the person that God has created you to be and to live the life that he has called you to live. Freely you've received, freely give. That means if it is a free gift for you, then we're also called to give it away to others Freely, that's our responsibility as a church. And so I want you to think carefully this morning. I want you to think carefully before God, before your Father in heaven, who sees all and knows all. I want you to think very carefully and to pray with honesty this morning. How is it that you're involved in freely giving away what you have freely received? I want to share with you, as we draw this to a conclusion, and then we're going to come to the table together, I want to share with you one of the most challenging and yet most powerful quotes that I've ever come across in my life. It's, a, it's something I read on a regular basis. It's a fairly long quote, but it is such a powerful word. And it was written by a man named William Stringfellow in a book called Free and Obedience. Next slide. And uh, let's go to the next slide, actually. Here's, here is William Stringfellow in his apartment in the Bronx in New York City. He was a Harvard-trained lawyer who had a, a glittering career ahead of him. And he decided, in the response to the call of Jesus, uh, when he became a Christian, that he would give it all up and go and move into a tenement building in the 50s in New York City and he would spend the rest of his life serving the poor African-American community there as, free legal, as a free legal counsel, because he knew that so many of those folks were denied proper justice in the American legal system, and he wanted to correct that. He went with compassion, he went with grace, he moved in among the people. He really took seriously this call to live the good news. And in his time there, uh, God used him powerfully and he became one of the leading figures, although you've probably never heard of him, of the civil rights movement in the 60s in uh, New York City in America. His one-room apartment that he moved into from his very large suburban home, his one-room apartment was so small that his toilet was literally next to the sink in his kitchen. And he remembers that the first thing he noticed when he moved into his brand new home that he was going to spend the next several decades of his life in 
was the overwhelming smell of urine. However, it was his joy to serve Christ and the community there in this way. And this is what he wrote. And the reason I think this quote has so much power is because it comes from a man who lived exactly what he writes here. And I really hope this will challenge you. He says that Christians, next slide, are called to a radical involvement in the redemption of the world, an involvement which does not retreat even in the face of the awful power of death. The call of Christ means that Christians are free. We are free to enter into the depths of the world's existence with nothing to offer the world but their own lives. And this is to be taken literally. What the Christian has to give the world is his very life. The Christian is established in such an extreme freedom by the power of Christ, which is so much greater than the power of death, that the Christian lives secure from any threats which death may make. It is in exercising this ultimate freedom, in her involvement in the world, that the Christian also understands how to use whatever else is at her disposal, money, status, technical abilities, professional training, whatever else, as sacraments, that is, as the gift of her own life. The daily witness of the Christian in the world is sacramental rather than moralistic. What he means is that we're not just going out there to tell people how to behave, we are going out there to offer people our lives. The daily witness of the Christian in the world is sacramental rather than moralistic. The public witness of the Christian is a symbol and a communication of her death in Christ every day. In each situation in which she finds herself, she thereby demonstrates her faith in God's triumph over death in Christ. The Christian is free to enter into the midst of all or any of the ordinary realities of the world's existence. What he means is you can go anywhere into any place, knowing what they truly represent, without succumbing either to their lust for idolatry or the fear of the work of death of which they are evidence. The Christian is so totally free from the threat of death in his life and in the existence of the rest of the world that he can afford to place that life at the disposal of the world or anybody in the world without asking or expecting anything whatever in return. Now, I read that every time, every time I read it, I take a deep breath and I go, wow, I have got a long way to go because there's quite a lot that I hope I will get in return for my service to Christ and others, I'll be honest. I'm still self, self-centered, selfish, still struggle with all of that, as I'm sure you do. And so the challenge from this text and from that reading, that quote, again, where are we freely giving away what we have received freely from Christ? And if you're not doing anything, or if you're not sure where God is calling you, then I encourage you to challenge yourself to do something new. I think one of the signs that it's time for us to change, to grow up, to maybe be challenged in a new way is that we've become bored in our faith. That our prayers have sort of become a bit lackluster and ordinary. They're not stretching into new territory anymore. That we just feel a bit blah about following Jesus. That's usually a sign that it's time to do something new that whatever faith you've exercised up to this point has become not useless, but it no longer fit for purpose. God is calling you to a greater dimension of service. And if your faith feels like it's no longer being stretched, it's time to do something new. It's time to challenge yourself. It's time to launch. It's time to get out of the family home, as it were, and take on a new challenge in Christ and see what he will do. Because I believe that every time we put ourselves out there in Christ's name, when we stretch for something that seems maybe beyond us, when we reach forward in faith, there will always be a dimension available to us in Christ Jesus where we'll find the resources, we'll find the power, we'll find the strength we need to do what it is that we are reaching for. Because we're never reaching beyond where Christ is. Christ has gone into death and through the other side. There is nowhere you can go in this world, there's no challenge you can face in this world where Christ Jesus isn't already present. So you do not need to be 
afraid. Ephesians 2 says this, just the last verse I'll read. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That means if you're reaching forward to do something good in Jesus' name, he's already there. He's already prepared the way. He's already advanced ahead of you. And so, friends, all of this tells me that I am a sent one, that like those early disciples, I have been called by name, as Jesus says in this passage, he knows every hair on our head, we're worth more than many sparrows. He knows each of us, and he has called each of us, and he is sending each of us. So the question is, where is Jesus sending you? How is he sending you? And you might feel like you're not prepared. Tim Keller says this, there are some needs, friends, it's easy to write ourselves off, but the truth is, what Tim Keller says, there are some needs that only you can meet. And if you don't meet them, those people who need you won't receive what they need from you. So there are some needs only you can meet. There are some hands that only you can hold. There are some demons that only you can cast out. Because of who you are, you have to get involved, you have to give. You might say, I'm too busy, I'm not equipped enough, I don't feel prepared. Well, that's how I feel, that's how the first disciples felt. If you feel that way, welcome to life in the kingdom of God. Welcome to the journey. Will it be hard at times? Of course it will. Will it be worth it? Eternally, forever and ever. Amen. So as we come to the table this morning, what do we remember? Just go forward the next couple of slides, if you wouldn't mind, just toward the end. What do we remember about what is happening when we take communion? Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Why? So that we can remember that now we are his body, which is to be freely given to others. Freely we've received, freely give. So as we prepare our hearts to come to the table, we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat, all of you, for this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and after he'd blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink of this, all of you, for this cup is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let me pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. By what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we might delight in your will and walk in your ways and do all that you have called us to. For the glory of your name, we pray. Amen.